So welcome back to another Behind the Theme. Today we'll be talking about Sekigahara again and we're continuing with the battle of Sekigahara. Last we left off, the battle had begun in earnest and both sides were at a stalemate. Ieyatsu and Ishida Mitsunori's forces had pushed back and forth and no one seemed to have a definite victory at hand. And so it's at this point that Ishida decided to call down his trump card which was Kobakawa Hideki whose position flanked both armies. So whoever Kobakawa Hideki attack would definitely gain a definite advantage. The problem is when the flare was shot, Kobakawa did not move and neither did he respond to any kind of call for him to keep his promise to both sides. One for Ishida to flank Iyatsu and for Kobakawa's secret message to Iyatsu that he would support him. So all eyes were on Kobakawa Hideki. And it's at this point that Tokugawa Iyatsu did probably what is the most famous thing in the Battle of Sekigahara. He called out his Akubusie and fired at the position of Kobakawa Hideki. Now, from the sources that I read, my most trusted source, which is Anthony Bryant 1600 from Osprey, that book said that Iyasu fired behind the position of Kobakawa Hideki, but basically in his direction. And of course, this is very strange because if you look at it, at least from a board gaming perspective, it's like if you're playing a game like Game of Thrones 2nd Edition where you need to negotiate and everything, and you only met a first person a few times and you wanted his help, and instead of saying what you can give him and everything like that, you walk up to him and you slap him in the face and say that, will you help me now? Strangely to say, in one of the weirdest decisions in history to a lot of historians, Kobakawa Hideki moved and shouted that their target was Otani Yoshisugu, which was on the Ishida side. Now, we're going to pause here a moment because I want to talk about this. And in many facets, they said that this was um, Tokugawa Yasu's biggest gamble. Because if he had fired into Kobakawa Hideki's position, and in any normal situation, you would think that Kobakawa Hideki would then turn on him. Now, having played poker before, that from reading about Iyatsu, that he's probably a very good poker player. In the sense that he takes calculated risks very, very seriously, he does things when he feels confident in it. And there are times in poker where... You just know you can't lose to someone because you can you can look into their souls. You know you know that the guy has a strong hand. You know that the guy has a weak hand. You just know how to react. I think in this case with Kopakawa Hideki, that's what happened. Tokugawa Iyasu knew his opponent, knew this person so well, and he knew what made him tick. So as much as people call it a very big gamble, I would argue that it was a gamble. But it was a gamble that Tokugawa Iyasu knew favored him. Now, segueing into Otani Yoshisugu, this guy was amazing. He is one of the most prominent characters in the Battle of Sekigahara because of several factors. One, he had leprosy. Two, he was almost blind. And three, he was badly disabled. He was so disabled that he had to be carried into battle on a litter. But that being said, with all these disabilities, he not only came to the battle, he still commanded his forces. And from all accounts, he was still very sharp. When he found out that Hideki was not moving when the flare was shot, he took half his men and turned them to protect against a possible defection from Kobakawa Hideki, of which, of course, we now know it happened. So you can tell that even with all his disability, that he was a seasoned warrior. It's just an unfortunate situation of his body. Now to add on to Otani Yoshisugu's problem with the flank that he was holding in the air with only his very small force compared to what was attacking him now, he was already outnumbered by Kobakawa Hideki. But when Kobakawa Hideki defected, the problem is that all the troops on Mount Sasao, which was where Hideki was positioned, all the other warlords there also defected with him, meaning that the position of Otani Yoshisugu was unattainable, even with the fact that he had prepared. But in the end, of course, they were overrun. And it, at this point, seeing that it was impossible for a person in his state to run away, you'd imagine that he was being carried by people on a litter, even if they all ran at the same pace, they were not going to outrun a normal soldier who was not encumbered by carrying their lord. So seeing that he would never get away, he called one of his very loyal samurai, Yuwa Sagoro, to basically cut off his head and hide it because Otani Yoshisugu did not want his head as a trophy to the enemy. And to the credit of Yuwa Sagoro, he did just that. He cut off his lord's head, weeping, and hit the head, and then did something which amazed me, more so that because of the absolute suffering he would have suffered in that, to make sure that the head would literally never be found, because he was the only person who knew where the head was buried, he committed seppuku on himself without a second, meaning that there was no one to cut off his head when he plunged that sword into his stomach and cut it open, 
And he had to, again, agonize over 20 over minutes for him to bleed out from his stomach. To his credit, the head has never been found. So I think that's one of the best signs of loyalty at the Battle of Sekigao, if not, I say, the best one. Now, during when all this was happening, let's now jump back to the Shimazu position. Remember the last time the Shimazu were finally forced into fighting by Io Naomasa. Now, they were attacked by Io Naomasa and his Red Devils with Matsudaira Tadayushi, Tokugawa's fourth son, at 11.30 a.m. By 12 o'clock, the Shimazu Samurai finally counter-attacked. When this happened, they did one of the most famous things at the Battle of Sekigao. <laughs> Japanese people still very much remember, which is called Sutegamari, which is a fighting retreat. Now, the problem that Shimazu Yoshihiro had was that Hideki's forces were already flowing in, and basically the Shimazu position was cut off from retreat. On top of that, they were being chased and pursued extremely heavily by Io Naomasa's Red Devils. I mean, it was a relentless an attack on the Shimazu position, and the best defense was a great offense. So he pulled his men together and literally fought forward into the position of the Tokugawa. Accounts say that he also wanted to be able, maybe, to kill Tokugawa by riding into that position. This is similar to what Oda Nobunaga, where he basically, with his, I think, 6,000 men, managed to defeat an army of the Imagawa at about 35,000, because they killed Daimyo, the Imagawa, during that battle. Then maybe he saw that he could be that in Sekigahara. Um, of course, he never reached Tokugawa Ieyasu. And from his um, force of 1,500 at the beginning of the battle, when he saw that his nephew Toyohisa was killed in the battle, at that point, he basically only had about 80 men with him left. And to add to that problem, Ionamasa was, again, relentlessly pursuing it. I mean, literally relentless. He wanted the head of Yoshihiro. And it's at this point that Providence played a part. The Akabuse of the Shimazu fired a musket ball and it hit Ionamasa. Now, this is Providence because by hurting Ionamasa, the entire pursuit halted from, because all the troops had to take care of the most important thing at the moment, which was save their daimyo. And this one pause of the pursuit allowed Yoshihiro to basically retreat by skirting around, because the way to safety in the normal sense, when the battle lines were started, was this way, for the line of retreat. Now, this whole area had now been covered by the Hideki troops and everything. So the only way Yoshihiro could literally run away was to literally cross around the battlefield to where the Mori troops were, which literally meant that instead of retreating this way, he retreated that way. Which is again another reason why this retreat is so famous is because he went in the wrong direction. But it was on purpose because that's the only way he could retreat. The thing about Sekigahara is that we tend to forget there was another front on Sekigahara, which was where the Mori troops were. And even when, and it's arguable that even when Hideki defected on Mount Sasao, there was enough troops on the position of the Mori to actually still turn the tide in the Ishida faction. Because the Mori troops outnumbered the troops of the Tokugawa in that position by quite a bit. On top of that, that was the rear lines of the Tokugawa position, meaning that that part was threatened. Tokugawa had to deal with it, meaning taking away valuable resources from the front that he was fighting with Ishida Mitsunari. Now, we, of course, we all know that what happened in that the Kikawa clan held back all the Mori troops and they did not participate in the battle at all. That deciding the battle, the minute Kobakawa Hideki basically defected to the Tokugawa. Is at this point when the battle was basically over, Tokugawa's personal men were now allowed to move forward even further up the battlefield that he finally put on his helmet. When throughout the whole battle, when all the fighting was taking place, he never did wear his helmet. And of course, he uttered the famous words. And whether he uttered it in this exact way or did he utter it during the battle or after the battle and so on, it's arguable, but he said the famous lines of that after victory, one should tighten the cords of his helmet. Basically meaning that one should always be vigilant because one never knows what might happen even at the point of victory. So that's the conclusion to the Battle of Sekigahara. Next time we'll finally come to the end of the series by talking about what happened to all our protagonists because I feel it will be remiss in history to not tell you what happened to all these people. So comment, subscribe, thank you very much, till next word.